Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. You can see our next guest, Kat Conning, on the HBO series, The Deuce, my favorite show on television right now. It's fantastic. You can also hear her new single, Stay on the Line, which is out now, and you can see her at The Standard tomorrow night in New York City. And you can right now give her a big round of applause right here on the Build stage. Kat Conning, let's hear it. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. What do you want to talk about first, your music or the deuce? Oh my God, don't throw me for a loop. Okay, I don't we'll know. talk about we the deuce first. We like. got the poster right here. Yeah. I love the deuce. I love David Simon. Uh, I love George Pelicanos, both of them. Simon created The Wire. Pelicanos was on The Wire and is a, is a crime novelist. They're great. The first season was good. The second season is brilliant. They've, they're blowing it out of the water with this season. What is it like to join a show like this that is doing something radical, approaching this industry in, a, and I think, a radical way for television, as well as just being having really great writing? Yeah, I mean, where do I start? It's my TV debut, so, like, first of all, I'm just grateful. Never going to be, be this TV good, sorry. Yeah, this is the top. Like, I peaked already. We'll see where I go from here. It's down for sure. Um, just kidding, you guys. You can laugh. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, seriously, though, it's a dream. I mean, I grew up watching a lot of these people in movies and on TV, and to be in a room with them, let alone to act with them, is crazy. Um, but yeah, most importantly, the writing is really... Can I curse here? Mm -hmm. It's really fucking good. Yeah. It's great writing. This was the shortest um, audition I have ever done in my life. It was like one line. If you watch the first episode, then you've heard it. Like one or two. But I basically just introduce myself and say that I'm an actress and a dancer, which is to actually say that I'm a burlesque dancer. And just the way that he wrote it, it was so obvious that she's really proud of what she does. And to be able to get that much about a character from one line and to just like totally understand her the, the second you speak, it's and, amazing. And that's something that you, you yourself don't have personal experience dancing burlesque, but you've been around burlesque dancers and you've worked around them before. Was that something that you, when you went into the audition you carried with you, did you talk to them about that at all? Yeah, of course. I mean, I do actually kind of, I mean, I'm thinking about what people would think if they heard me say that I don't do burlesque. I do, but I like to say that I don't because when you meet a real burlesque dancer, they make their own costumes. They like have full concepts for every three minute act they ever do. Right, so when someone calls me a journalist and I'm like, no, I just interview people. Yeah, you're like, no, I'm just, I just have a nice suit and they let me go on TV. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, they, uh, they're amazing. And so I, I have like sung and like been in burlesque shows where I'm more like an MC or whatever. So I have proximity to a lot of those people. Mm -hmm. And being in the show has been incredible because it's one thing to play somebody that's kind of from that world, but it's another to be a part of something that they feel really represented by, mm -hmm. that they feel is like accurate, celebratory, and interesting. Like how often does a burlesque dancer, let alone a sex worker or a stripper or whatever, have a whole story yeah. in a show? Well, that's something that this show does. Every character, they're very attuned to or attentive to having all of the people have three-dimensional stories, even if it's just for a flash. You get a sense that, that that is a character that has been fleshed out. And I think that's because they're, it seems they're really sensitive to the fact that this is an industry based off of flesh and in some ways could be kind of consider a con considered a, uh, a conveyor belt, you know, of, of, of nightmares and broken dreams. Yeah. And they're very smart in making it so it's not just the strippers or just the prostitutes. Yeah, and it also doesn't feel like something they're just, like, cautionary about. It yeah. feels like something they're truly, like, that's integral to the story. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a side to read for hooker or dead hooker or like one line that's like, what the is hooker the is in the background, like she is naked. That's all you get to hear. What is the dead hooker's line on the side? She doesn't get a oh, line. okay, she doesn't get a yes, line. Yes, it's the truth. I mean. I'm dead. Yeah, she's just there in probably something shiny and very little clothing. Um, but it's really, really exciting that this story is um, about these women in this particular time in the 70s when it was what you would think it could be at its worst. You know, they're like unsafe and they are fending for themselves and bad shit happens all the time. And then in this season, thank God, there's a little bit of a shift of power. But um, it's, yeah, it's really cool to see those stories be told, especially because although we're like a little safer now... There's still, like, you know, we still experience, like, a parallel level of, like, sexism and misogyny. And with the president that we have now, like, there's no denying that, like, things have not changed that much. And so it's really cool to see this period piece illustrate to us right in front of our faces that 
that like scenarios that I know a lot of women, whether they're in sex work or not, have experienced in some microaggressive way. Right. It's been an ongoing struggle for a long time, and there's been progress and setbacks and progress and setbacks. Yeah. Uh, what is it like, uh, you know, the first time we meet your character, she has just married uh, James Franco's Frankie, which is the twin of the of the other character of the yeah, other it's guy. Very confusing. Very um, what is it like working with Franco? This is his wild card character. He's kind of uh, crazy and hilarious. Yeah, I mean, I also love the show, and I'm also a big fan fan of James Franco. Like, I grew up watching him and stuff, and have always just wanted to improv with him. Honestly, you can just kind of tell in the work that he does that he's having a lot of fun and playing off the people around him. And so, this being my first TV opportunity, I was kind of like, how much? can I also do? Like, I'm the new girl who knows what they want this character to be. And on day one, I was, like, very careful and tiptoeing around a little bit. And by the end of this season, I feel like we had a really good rapport of, like, you know, batting back and forth and joking. And the, the scenes are always changing. It's pretty amazing that he plays twins and he's still improvising. So he's improvising and then acting up against his improvisation. And I experienced that on my first day. So that was pretty crazy to act with him. So twice. they allow him to improvise a fair amount. Yeah, allow him. Like, I think that's what they want. Like, that's what he does. He's amazing. It's, he just gets on set and does it. And the crazy thing, like Unsung Heroes, there's somebody who learns all of his improv, let alone his lines, and acts that back at him. And it's pretty... It's crazy. It's like a like four-part scene. So that they can have continuity for the things that he creates? Is that what you mean? Yeah, so that he can act back at that person as if it's what he just did, which is slightly different than what was written in the script, which they learned the night Maybe before. Maybe because he's doing the twins? Yes, exactly. Oh, when wow. doing the twins. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So he's essentially improvising with some... Wow, that's that's wild. Yeah, so that scene is with... Um, oh, right, because your first scene when we when we meet you is with, with the two them. twins. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that was my like first day. <laughs> And um, I just would like to shout out to Margarita Laviva because she also was like a huge grounding part of my first day because I sat down and I was like, what is this like? What do I do? This is so crazy. And she was like, you're good. It was, it was a really good first day. What do you think she meant by you're good? Like this is a like, good Like I don't think that's what she said with her words, but she just gave me the vibe that like I should trust myself and that everybody's cool and that I can be, you know, I could experiment a little bit more. Uh, so you are going to be playing at the Standard tomorrow night. Yeah, right? come come see it. Are you coming? I'll be there. And you've got a single right now, right? Hold the line. Stay on the line. Stay on the line. Yeah. It's okay. I'm glad you made the first mistake. I might say something wrong, too, so it's good. Yeah, it's good for me to embarrass myself on the thing that I've been doing for a number of years it rather than you who's doing it yeah. for the first time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's good. Yeah. Um, let's talk about this. How long have you been recording music? Um, only really for the last, like, three years. How did that start? So as a dancer, like a concert dancer that started with ballet ever since I was like three years old, um, I went to school for dance and then I graduated. My first dance job was this um, company called Company XIV that does like Baroque burlesque, which means that a lot of dancers come together and wear these really amazing outfits and then there are opera singers and and whatnot. And anyway, I got the job and I wasn't that good of a dancer compared to the other people in the company and I wanted to keep it. And so I bluffed and told him that I could sing, which was like shower singing at the time. And he was like, okay, sure, send me a video. And I sent him a video of me singing, and he gave me a part, and that part was reviewed by the New York Times, and they were like, where's this girl's album? So I went from genuinely having everyone in my family tell me to keep my day job every time that I sang in the car to um <laughs> playfully hopefully yeah kind of okay they were like we put money into your dance classes like do that <laughs> do that um but i didn't really even know that i wanted to sing that badly and then i had the experience singing in that show that was different than when i thought it could be you know i thought that as a dancer that i would go into dancing singing on broadway and that that was my option i never considered making my own music and then when I really sang, like, in my natural voice in the way that felt comfortable to me in that show, it was so well-received that I decided to pursue it. And I was really lucky to have, to be honest, I was really lucky to have that validation from the Times because a lot of people were willing to collaborate with me based on that. And I had very little experience. And again, that's, like, three years ago. So What were your influences going into collaborating? What were some musicians that you were liking that you were thinking, maybe we can do something like that? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm probably the most confusing collaborator when it comes to that question because I have really eclectic taste. When a, when a producer or a songwriter asks me what I, li I like, I'm usually like, um, oh no, anybody know James? Blake? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I didn't say James Blunt. Um, I couldn't be sure. Anyway, it was James Blake, and I was like, production-wise, I want sounds from like Red Coat, and um, you know, it was just about the sounds. I didn't even really think as a singer or even a songwriter at the time. I was just like, this is what makes me want to move as a dancer. And the songs that I was singing in the show were covers um, that were like pop songs, super, super stripped down. So it also gave me this sense of respect for pop music and, a, and the notion that I could approach pop in my own way versus like the pop that I grew up like Britney Spears with, you know, that's like super produced and super in your face. And pop still is good. still amazing, obviously, but I never saw myself being that, maybe extra is the word, like there's something about what's happening with um, music right now, pop in particular, where like your natural voice or your intimate voice has like a place in bigger, more lush production and less like in your face, super shiny, like Backstreet Boys 2000s. I'm obsessed with the Backstreet Boys, to be fair. I really am. I know exactly what you're saying. I think of someone like huge pop star like Lord or something, and it's a very yeah. intimate voice, but with a I very just, lush production. Yeah, I just never thought I could do it, you know? And so the first time I sang, I was really surprised that anybody was interested. Um, but little- No one had told you before that you had a nice voice? They no. just always told you to keep your day job? Yeah, kind of. So for everybody out there, who gets told to keep your day job when you sing, you can be a professional you singer. You should be apparently. a pop star. Yeah. It's, it's pretty much a foolproof theory. Just they're do just it. just trying to tell you that you should be a pop star, yeah. essentially. <laughs> yeah, they're mad that you sound so good. Um, but uh, addendum about the Backstreet Boys, when I was really little, like really little and only wanted to be a dancer, I was so obsessed with the Backstreet Boys that I wrote them a letter um, because I had one of those teeny bopper magazines where they give you a fake address. And I wrote them a letter and I was like, just so you know, I'm not a fan. I do think your band is missing me. <laughs> I'm not a fan, you, you need me. I would like to contribute my talents to the Backstreet Boys. And I couldn't play any instruments or anything. And I just was like, I feel in my heart that I'm probably a Backstreet Boy. I love the imagining that like someone would get that letter and be like, oh, I think she's right. <laughs> and they would take that to someone else, and it would go to someone else, and then go up to a Backstreet Boy. That's the true story of how I got my all of my singles out today. They were like, maybe you're not a Backstreet Boy, but we'll do what we can. Well, let's talk about the single. What is uh, Stay on the Line about? It's about phone sex. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, nobody told you that? No. Oh, yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, that's the crass version. It, it's just about... It's about phone sex. It's... A, but, but I'm a romantic at heart, right? Like, the song just flowed out of me, and I didn't even realize that's what it was going to be about until I was done writing it. But, um, yeah, ultimately, I think, like a lot of my songs, it's loosely about, or specifically about sex, but sex is a metaphor for feeling connected to somebody or feeling understood or received for the first time. I don't think time. that's a metaphor. I it, think with sex, you're literally connected to somebody. Literally, but yeah. also, of course, like, what this song is full of, which, like, if you listen closely enough, you can hear me say what I'm saying because I tend to sing in, like, mushy, mushy words. But um, the lyrics are an abstract illustration of how it feels to be close to somebody. And I wanted to take this like relatively crass topic and make it feel irreverent and elegant and magical because I think that sex is a part of romance that we often like leave out for some reason. Like all of our like fairy tales are about, you know, the princess meeting the prince and then whatever the fuck else happens. And I think like sex is nothing to be ashamed of. It's a really exciting part of connecting with people. And the more we talk about it, the safer and better it gets, so. So the deuce is kind of really the show for you. Yeah, You're it really a, is. Uh, a very sex positive person. Yeah. I mean, everybody should be sex positive. I, I don't think, but that's something that you you care deeply about. It sounds. Yeah, I really do. I think as a queer artist, also, I think it's super super important to, that we talk about sex because the more that you feel comfortable talking about what you like, the more people come out. The more people are safe to come out and come out as whatever you are. If you're a freak who's into freaky shit, like find your freaky person. 
if you're just a queer person who's never met another queer person, like, let's keep coming out. Let's keep talking about what we like and getting better about talking about sex so that consent is still easy and sexy to do. Like, we're in this era that the Deuce is talking about all the time because nothing's changed since the 70s because we don't talk enough. We don't talk enough about how to engage sexually. My, my, I, I'm, I'm consider myself sex positive, but I also, I love talking about sex when it's subversive and when it still feels kind of dirty. And I miss that that doesn't really exist anymore. That everyone's kind of like, yeah, let's just talk about sex. It's totally fine. It's like, no, I liked it when it was kind of transgressive to have sex conversations. Yeah, and I mean, I think like being super okay with sex in this like Tinder era is one thing. Like, sure, sex is everywhere. You can have it in five minutes if you want. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about getting sex. I'm talking about making sex, like accepting that sex is a fulfilling thing. Mm -hmm. And going about, like I'm not about the death of foreplay. Like foreplay is sex. This song is all foreplay, it's phone sex. You know, so I think it's about like how to engage with people in a way that's truly fulfilling, not just about like hookups yeah. in the Tinder era. But hookups can be truly fulfilling as well. Totally. Listen, it's all on. It's all out Positive. there. It's all It's good. all cool. Listen, yeah. as long as it's consensual. You do you. You do you. Get your freak on. Yeah. Let your freak flag fly. Whether it's on the phone, in the sheets, or just alone watching the deuce. Whatever you want to do. Dude, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Let's get some I fun. don't know that I can endorse that for my actor friends. Maybe watch something else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first question. What do we got? Right here. Hi. Um, so my question is, um, who in the industry right now would be like your dream collaboration for music? Oh, for music? Mm. Man, maybe it's totally trite, but I really want to work with King Princess. I think she's doing, do you know who that is? Um, maybe. She's great. She's a young queer pop star. She's making awesome music with Mark Ronson. It's V sexy. It's supernatural. And um, she's just doing a really great job. Also, I mean, I guess I'm like used to talking about people who I may have something kind of like, so I'm trying to think of who's like opposite of me that would be cool to do something with. I would like die to do something with Justin Timberlake. I'm not as into his phase. Sorry, Justin Timberlake. I'm more into like Justified, you know, Justified era. You know, like Man of the Woods? It's just not really my thing. I like to be extra and glam now, you know what I'm saying? But um, I am into his, uh, his work on Justified, and I would love to do the Super Bowl with him just because he like seems to be the darling of the Super Bowl. Like, invite me next time. That's all I'm saying. Uh, one more. Hi. Um, so good. the pressure's on. Yeah, I know. I have to stand up and everything, get real close. Um, so I'm wondering, because I know you started off in like dancing and then you got more into acting. So that transition and then starting on this show, what's been the most like challenging part of like that transition and starting on this show with like huge name actors and people who are like so amazing in the industry? Yeah, fair question. Um, the ch most challenging part about like approaching three things is being able to stick around when you're not allowed to do all of them. Like being an artist in New York, I've been here for years where I'm just a waitress, you know? I've been here for years where I'm whatever. And, and all of these things have come from me being like, I can, I can dance, I can sing, I can act, and standing up and not being afraid to be a Renaissance woman and um, being lucky enough for sticking around, I think that they actually come to be, because the hardest thing is surviving in New York. Um, but holding my own around those actors, I think, is about... Um, Doing just, the job. Yeah, and connecting to your pleasure. That's my, that's my motive, if that makes any sense to anybody. If, if you don't feel connected to your pleasure and your ownership of yourself and the choices you're making on screen or anywhere, then other people don't feel it. They feel that you're nervous, and they, they don't feel permission to also enjoy you. So you could do that with anybody. Well, you're going to stick around here, and you're going to sing for us, right? Yeah, I'll sing for you. Please. Okay, great. Okay, great. Uh, first, we're going to give you a round of applause. We're going to say that you're performing again tomorrow at The Standard. Yeah, Your song, free. Stand the Line. The Deuce is on HBO right now. Give Cat County a round of applause.